for coming. That's all of us that we're expecting today because we heard from Sid that he can't make it. So, so that means we're calling the meeting to order or whatever it is we're supposed to do at the beginning. We are, we are now officially um, meeting instead of just chit-chatting. Uh, we, let's see, I think the first thing, am I supposed to say who's here? Why doesn't everybody just say they're here or something? Yeah, I think we're supposed to say that we are here, we can hear and be heard. So I just All right, so uh, Erica, are you here? Erica Piedad is here, it can be heard. Allegra. I am here, I'm sorry, I'm wrestling my dog who doesn't <laughs> want to be on the camera, but wants my attention. Uh, okay, Rob. I'm here. Paul. Here. Uh, Ashley. I'm here. Marisha. Here. And we know that Sid is not here. And so here we are. Um, so the minutes, which is the first thing on our agenda, went out late, I think, but I believe that they everyone got them. Um, did any, does anybody have any questions? Usually what we have done is just if if they look okay and no one says anything to the contrary, we accept them. We just accept them as minutes. And if it's supposed to approve, whatever the difference is, I don't know. But is there anyone who sees any reason for not accepting the minutes? Please raise your hand or speak or do something. Uh, then hearing nothing, I will assume that we have accepted the minutes. And so the next thing on our agenda is delightfully, we have asked Tim McCarthy from Craig's Doors to come and talk to us about what Craig Doors is up to these days. He is here and uh, Nate will, whatever you do, make him into a panelist so that he can give us a little bit of an update on Craig's Doors. Hi, Tim. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Tim. For those of you I haven't uh, had the pleasure of meeting yet, um, super honored to be in attendance tonight. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so there's been lots of changes at Craig's Doors in the past four months. That's a bit of an, an understatement. Um, we have undergone uh, an, a, a, a full uh, transition from the executive team down to the director of operations, um, which in and of itself is a, is a pretty dramatic change. Um, on top of that, we have scaled uh, to a second hotel in Hadley. Uh, I'll get into those details later. I should say um, our primary source of funding was put out to bid for the first time, um, which is anxiety producing. Um, but we've been spending uh, a ton of time and effort on rebuilding relationships with partner organizations uh, in the human services field um, with small businesses uh, and, and the citizens. But we're hoping to launch our first development campaign um, within the, the next month or so, the first in uh, over five years, from what I understand. Um, we're still getting caught up on on thank yous for all of the unsolicited donations. Amherst is a, a truly amazing community. Um, we, we are so lucky to be here. Um, so as a product of the transition, we have made improvements um, virtually everywhere. We were lucky enough to have a consulting firm come in and, and kind of help us revamp Craig's doors into uh, a second life with, with some of the professional infrastructure like policies and procedures um, and ensuring that those are being enforced. Uh, we've also um, been really working to, to, to take care of our staff uh, who are just an amazing team of folks. Um, we continue in that mission to make sure that that our staff feels supported, cared for, um, and that they can perform the job to the, to the best of their capacity. So that's a little bit of housekeeping. Um, in terms of service delivery, uh, we're currently 
operating out of uh, 434 North Pleasant in the green trailer, um, which has been home for some time. We've developed that space into a resource center. Uh, so any members of the community can pop in. Um, those who are unhoused but are not staying with us are able to uh, acquire case management, um, survival tools, uh, and resources, and uh, we're able to refer them to other agencies where necessary, um, which has been wildly successful in its newest iteration. Um, across the street from 434, we are still operating at the University Lodge. Um, currently, our guest count um, from the 20 rooms is at 36. So we've almost accomplished dual occupancy for every room. We're really trying to make the, the most out of every resource that we have um, in supporting the most vulnerable members of the community. Um, we, as I'd stated earlier, also had expanded into Hadley where we are operating another motel uh, transitional housing setting. Um, over there, we have another 20 rooms, uh, which are occupied by 32 folks. So um, we're just under 70 in terms of our, our total sheltering count. Um, on November 1st, we are hoping to transition to the Lutheran Church. That's, that's the goal. Um, they are interested in um, regressing or reverting back to an overnight shelter model. Um, which is a bit out of line with where Craig's Doors has evolved. So I guess if I could say the greatest change and my proudest area of focus falls under case management for Craig's Doors. Uh, my predecessor was had, had done amazing things and uh, a, a lot of really quality contributions to the community that we serve. Um, among them was managing the scale. Our, our budget drastically increased relative to COVID. Um, and we found ourselves uh, at a scale that we had never operated from. Um, in that process, I think the focus, again, from the previous administration was the heads on beds model, which is great. It's a harm reduction approach. It just says, let's get as many people as we can into the shelter. Let's get as many shelter spaces as we can, and we're going to take care of as many folks as possible. So Stepping into the executive director position, um, I, I take a bit of a, a different approach. I think that in, in exercising the way that we were, we were bringing in folks from other municipalities and serving and, and sort of covering the bases from some of the obligations and responsibilities uh, that we observe to be um, on the shoulders of the other towns where people in some cases were uh, transitioning to us. So. Our objective um, is to support other communities in their capacity to deliver services to their most vulnerable members. And in our case, to focus on um, serving our guests in a way, uh, serving the homeless population and community in a way that is deeper rather than broader. Um, that's to say, instead of continuing to expand the number of beds, we're focused on taking care of folks who are from the Amherst, Hadley, you know, our neck of, of the woods, um, and and really deepening the services. So uh, we're dedicated towards offering wraparound services, which includes a focus uh, via case management of ensuring that everyone has access to um, healthcare, to mental health care, financial literacy training, uh, and then perhaps most importantly in our space, um, housing uh, placement support. Um, we're working with the three county COC uh, to distribute vouchers to our most vulnerable guests, um, and we're working with virtually every housing authority in the state, uh, trying to navigate opportunities that might be best for our guests, recognizing that every guest is unique. Um, a part of that focus is recognizing that Craig's Doors is not a medical or clinical space. So we're not dealing with diagnoses at all. Um, we're dealing with behaviors. We're a behavior-based shelter um, and we recognize our limitations in that sort of service delivery. So um, as we continue to expand, we, we don't anticipate any further increase in the number of beds. Of course, if the, if the need from a county perspective is articulated, we will always step up to bat. But in terms of self-direction, we're really working on deepening our services to the folks 
who we already have, because otherwise the sheltering system, as broken as it is right now, um, it really just contributes to the problem. So it's excellent to have a, a harm reduction philosophy and foundation, but the heads on beds model just means that we take care of folks for four months, they go back into the woods, they live in isolation, they live um, in, a, in a sense of being sort of outcasts from the community. Um, they continue to suffer, they come back in to get warm for four months, they go back out to suffer, they come back in for four months. So since we've executed our, our broader, uh, deeper dedication to case management, we've seen um, record numbers for housing placements uh, for Craig's Doors, not only for Craig's Doors, but for the region. Um, it's becoming a bit of a joke. Uh, I was speaking to Pamela Schwartz earlier, who's um, the director of the Western Massachusetts Homelessness Coalition. I might have that position wrong, but she was uh, commenting on the fact that we have outpaced every other organization in a way that is inexplicable. To me, it's very explicable and it's the product of very deliberate efforts um, put into to particular aspects of our service delivery um, and trying to really create a sense of community and home for our folks. Uh, last week, we started our first activities groups, which are really just non-clinical group counseling uh, sessions that are exercised through art therapy. Um, we had a journaling class yesterday, and it's just amazing to see how, how desperate some of our folks are for just positive engagement rather than sitting up in their rooms or returning to their, their more maladaptive coping mechanisms um, because we are a wet shelter. Uh, we're seeing some really productive um, engagement both with each other and with the staff and with the larger community. So it's a really exciting time at Craig's Doors. Um, we continue to push forward again with the sort of Carl Rogers mentality that uh, you don't need to be a, a clinician to be a therapeutic individual in someone's life. So uh, I'm incredibly lucky to have the staff that I have. Um, the support of the community that we've seen thus far is remarkable. Um, Dave Zomek um, from uh, the town governance has been just inexplicably supportive and, and truly helpful. And so it's been a real team effort. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry if I went long, I get a little excited when-, when It's okay. It's management stuff. It's okay. Let me see if there are any questions, but I've remembered something I forgot. Allegra, do you remember you're supposed to take notes today? Clearly I did not. <laughs> oh dear. Um, I'm oh, well, so well, for all what was just said that I will- um, so I we'll just and yeah, I will go can, again. <laughs> I apologize. Yeah. So yeah, well, I apologize for not reminding you. It's written <laughs> on a piece of paper here, but I got to whatever and didn't say anything. I apologize too. If this is being recorded, so I should have said that this meeting is being recorded, and there is a tr will be a transcript. Oh, like I can send you. It's not, you know, it's I don't know, eighty five percent accurate or whatever it is. But that, I'll go grab help. paper to continue my note taking responsibilities. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we have a couple minutes anyway we could see if anybody has a question they'd like to ask Tim Paul has his hand up Paul and then Rob and me so I, I mean I first I do want to credit uh, the past administration for really managing through a rough COVID time with incredible uh, effort and um, resilience and expanding services and being creative and how they expanded into University Motor Lodge and and I think just you know moving year round all that stuff so to credit to to um, uh, to Kevin for all the work that he did and um, and and, to, and to securing the additional funding so I think we start there I love everything you're saying Tim in terms of moving into a deeper direction in terms of um, not just the harm reduction model. I think the town is is supportive of, obviously the town is supportive of it. And I think that the, the whole sort of um, area is going at 132 Northampton Road, which is our um, supportive housing, is a big piece of that. And we hope to do more of that in our town. That's, we're moving forward on some projects that might lead to additional um, uh, beds like that, that will help in that transition to um, helping to not solve the homeless problem, but to give people homes. Um, and so I just, I loved everything you said. The energy that you're bringing is palpable. Everybody in the community feels what you've brought to it. The leadership of, you know, the, the board leadership of 
Craig Stores is really re-energized by, I think a lot of it is due to your um, sort of leadership that you've brought. So just thank you for stepping up and being being there. So. Thank you so much. And I, I do as well want to echo um, Paul's sentiment, and I apologize if, if I wasn't laudatory enough. What Kevin accomplished is immeasurable. It, it's it's miraculous. I mean, legitimately, he, he took on COVID head on. We managed that, again, just remarkably well. So yeah, if I, if I was not uh, celebratory enough of my predecessor, I apologize. But it's definitely from the foundation that he built that, that we're moving forward from. Absolutely. So, uh, Rob. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I, um, what you were describing about deeper rather than, or deeper rather than broader, sounded somewhat like what Amherst Community Connections is doing. I was wondering if there was overlap or whether you were doing the same thing. Or yeah, how, yeah. How are you recording with them? No, it's a that's a terrific question, and and you're. Exactly right. Wei Ling and I um, have a really great relationship. We there is absolutely overlap. Um, there was a, an, an extended period where we were not. It's funny we we have a an office in the ACC building. Craig Stores does in the top right corner. That's technically our case management office, um, and so we developed an informal relationship. But we hadn't been collaborating at a level that. Uh, I really look forward to to pushing forward with. They do amazing work. Lots of it is the same work and, and on in occasion, the same funding sources that we have. Um, and I've had a, a myriad of conversations with Wei Ling where we were able to recognize the potential of us working together um, and us learning from her operation as well. Uh, again, we're a, we're a shelter who's moving into the case management space as um, that becomes standard operating procedure for, for shelters across the state. Um, but absolutely, we, we are working with them to a lesser degree than I would like right now. But as we stabilize and reach a point of sustainability, working closely with um, Amherst Survival Center and ACC, um, you know, though we sort of are the in-between from both of those programs. And we look forward to playing the role of facilitator and ensuring that that the three of us are are collaborating and, and working in conjunction with each other. Thanks. Looks like Erica a has a question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yes, I have a question. So uh, again, um, what Paul and, and Rob said in terms of accolades, is just amazing. And I absolutely agree with you. Um, we have individuals who have so much potential and engaging them um, and building on their strengths uh, is what you know, is, is what's going to be successful. Um, you mentioned that you have a really um, high uh, opportunity or ability to move people into housing. Where are they going and what kind of supports are they being provided to ensure that that engagement continues? Um, and I, I know that you know your, your heart is Hadley Amherst and my concern is that they're being moved out of a community that, they're, that you're creating for them uh, with each other and, and the connection with you. So how does then you know, that connection stay, not necessarily with you, but others who may provide that same engagement and support and strength-based um, sort of future um, you know, possibilities? Sure, but uh, that's a, such an insightful question. Um, there's there's a, f I I, there's a few responses that I have. And again, I, I have a tendency to uh, be you know amused by the the sound of my own voice, so I'll try and not go too too long. But as a quick anecdote, um, we had housed someone uh, th three months ago. They had been chronically homeless. Um, they had basically the last fifteen years of their life was five years in a shelter, five years in a in a woman's prison, five years in a shelter. We were able to acquire housing, um, and. I think we somewhat ignorantly thought that they would be thrilled by the opportunity. And they were um, until the day of move in um, when they grew too inebriated to move in, frankly. Um, and I think that there was, we had neglected to take into consideration that, okay, for five years, they were in a shelter surrounded by people with similar experience. Five years after that, they were in a woman's prison surrounded by people with similar experience. Five years after that, they were back in a shelter surrounded by people with personal experience. And now they're moving into their own place and it's isolation. And that, that sort of fear of, 
of being alone was something that we had neglected to take into consideration. So um, where the, let me try and answer all of the pieces. Where they are going um, is relative to each in individual guest. There are, it's, it's a really complicated and controversial subject within the sheltering community about, you know, some folks say, if you build the shelter and services, then you're going to draw people from other communities towards you. Others recognize rightfully that homeless people don't have an address, right? By nature of being unhoused, they're not citizens of anywhere. You know, they certainly are, but aren't treated as such or afforded the same opportunity. So um, I, I think that our focus is allowing our guests to move into whatever community they are afforded the opportunity to and they're interested in. So we're never forcing folks into housing um, circumstances. There's a lot of guests who turn down um, spaces, which was a bit, you know, it's always shocking, I think, to, to new staff. Um, there, I will give credit to Elliott Services, um, who function out of Northampton. They have a C-SPEC program that provides continued support for our folks when they get housed. Um, I can also say that most of the folks that we work with would love to be in Amherst and Hadley, and we've been really successful um, at, at finding those placements in Rolling Green and, and the various other apartment complex within the space. Um, there's that, that the, the complexes that are next to the Pride on the main road there heading toward the, the mall. Um, we've had three or four placements there. And so we try and work with what is available locally. Um, again, the guest takes the lead, right? They're the expert on their experience. They're the expert on where they want to go. And we try to acquiesce to that as much or accommodate for that as much as we can. Um, and then we always ensure that there's a warm handoff with another agency. It doesn't matter what it is. In one case, uh, in, the, in the anecdote that I'd shared, it was actually AA was helping them align with a sponsor and knowing that they had some sense of community before saying, um, good luck. The other thing is we're never just saying goodbye and good luck. We're, we're always ensuring that they know that we're available to them. The resource center is open nine to five, Monday through Friday. If they ever need to get a hold of us, we're here and we'll always be here to support them um, regardless of their housing status um, or any other circumstances that, that might impact their, uh, their, their larger experience. I think I hit most of what you're looking for, I hope. Cool. So we got a couple more minutes and it looks like Paul has another comment or question or something. Yeah, I just a uh, question if it's okay, Carol, if um, Tim, could you explain for the group and for the what, five members in our audience who, uh, how you came to this work? Oh, sure. Um, so my uh, journey is, is a bit of a long one. I spent most of my career uh, in, in business, particularly in development and sales. I lived um, actually, uh, Ashley, I know you're enjoying Hyannis right now. I, I spent um, years in Hyannis and uh, I worked for a, a small IT consulting firm um, out in Centerville, which is inside of Hyannis. Um, and from there, I ended up uh, volunteering and then serving on the board of directors for the United Way when I was about 24. Um, during my time at the United Way, I grew to really know the nonprofit space on the Cape and I fell in love with the work. I ended up uh, serving uh, on the board of directors for Shays No Limit Basketball League, which is also out of Hyannis. It's more of a mentorship program than it is a basketball league. There's a basketball component um, and fell in love with that. Uh, I came back to Western Massachusetts because I had been um, admitted into a master's program at, at UMass Boston. I was supposed to be here temporarily. COVID hit. I transitioned to Gould Farm, which is a, a residential therapeutic community in Otis, Mass, further west. I performed my internship there, loved it. Um, that wrapped up. I came back to Western Mass and started working for Kevin um, just as like a side job while I was earning my master's. Um, relative to circumstances that kept arising, I found myself in different positions uh, while navigating a full-time um, graduate uh, schedule. And then... Um, I, again, I just sort of fell in love. The, far, the farther I, my journey within the nonprofit space and particularly working with the unhoused um, grew, the more my affinity for the work grew. And, and uh, yeah, I've, I've really taken to it. I also have lived experience 
um, as it relates to uh, substance abuse um, personally and within my, my larger family. Um, and so, as I often say, you know, a couple of other decisions and I'd be in a bed uh, rather than in the office. So um, it's very much a, a, a strong reminder to me um, that this is a mission of, of equality and the importance of treating everyone with dignity and respect can, can't be understated and the impact that that can have. And so I've entered a space that allows me to remind myself every day, first of all, it offers purpose. And it reminds me uh, every day of the principles that I really try and, and guide myself through life with. Um, and it's an opportunity to exercise those in, in an act of service. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I, just add, can I add something for a second? Yeah. OK, um, well, I haven't looked at the Amherst Town website in a little while, but I just don't. I, can't imagine that we are using social media effectively because it just hasn't happened yet that there's like a place on the Amherst Town website that says, do you need rental assistance? Click here. Do you need emergency housing? Click here. Do you like, there's all these services that exist and I'm not totally sure that the outreach part is happening very effectively. And so it's like, there's a lot of resources that is good but i think we need to like reach out to people that need it better totally if i could I, i'll respond to that so to be clear ashley we're not uh we're not a municipal department we're not we're not a part of the amherst government but we experience the we're in that the position that you just described perfectly and captures where we're at as well in terms of outreach and a lack of social media um, the as a product of the transition, some of our passwords were lost, and so we're still trying to recover our Facebook account. Um, <laughs> but you could not be more on point, uh, both in terms of how we want to be advertising to the community so that they can potentially support and get involved with us, and simultaneously to the folks who need our services. Um, and you know, we had a very outdated, inaccurate website that we're currently overhauling as a development project. We're trying to get the students who work for us and are, are particularly savvy in the social media space um, to leverage those tools. Um, and yeah, I, it's just, a, it's a really astute observation and it's it's a project that, that we're actively working on. And I would say the entire community of folks who offer the service, the same services that we do across Western Mass are also a bit behind. Yeah, I mean, I would, Thank I you. would like to, see, I would like to see like a clickable link on the Amherst Town website, and I would love to see like a like a Twitter feed that has clickable links, and a Facebook feed that has clickable links. I mean, homeless people have the internet. Absolutely, that, well, that, that's that yeah. more than ever. Yeah, for sure. Um, absolutely. Yeah, there, there. You know, there's a lot of prejudices and um stereotypes surrounding the unhoused population but yeah they're incredibly nimble in their technology use because they're regularly having to sign on to a new network or utilize a new device or you know um that's how they get their information so um i totally support you in, in that sentiment yeah, nate looks like he has something to say sure. i'm sorry i did did you have more ashley no it's just that i mean i guess what I'm thinking is that creating housing is one thing that is very important. The, the avenues to get the people in the housing is kind of, is almost like a different thing, but it's, it's very important. It's as important, let's say. Absolutely. Nate? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Tim. I'm Nate, I'm a planner with the town and you know we'll probably meet more as the as the future goes on um you know part of the trust bylaw is to you know ensure kind of the the shelter in amherst and so you know when you apply for funding and you have a few different spaces I, i'd like to just know like you know is are you considering this all the spaces you know year round or is it going to ramp up seasonally and have you know the uml or the you know the lutheran church like what's so you know after this winter like what's the projection you know, for the following spring, summer, and then the next winter. And when you applied for funding, did you, you know, was there an average number of beds or what was kind of, 
what was, because right, I said, I think it's two years, right? You applied for two years of funding or is it a year to this day? I mean, it is new this year, but I was, yeah. I was just curious to know, you know, kind of what, you know, what the vision was with that, you know, for the next sure. say year or so, just, um, yeah, not just this winter, but through, you know, the next. Absolutely. So, um, it's that that's a question in process right now, I would say. Um, we did have to submit budgets to, to DHCD um, forecasting on, through 2024. So the 23 24 procurement period wrapped up. Um, and I will say that in an ideal space, we would be operating two facilities one, a congregate shelter, and one, the more sort of transitional housing space that the UML provides. In an ideal world, we would always have those two spaces, 24-7, 365, both of those spaces and, and our resource center. The reality that we've seen, particularly um, in this sort of experimental summer that we've, that we've utilized, it's the first time that we've been open um, with two sites through the summer. Usually sheltering is, is, is considered a, a winter uh, endeavor, but the number of lives that have been saved as a product of being indoors with us is an estimable. I mean, no, it probably is estimable. I would, but I would imagine probably nine to ten. Um, we have pulled people from encampments that uh, were critically ill. Um, we have uh, brought people back from overdoses via the administration of Narcan on our sites. All, all of which would have been impossible in an encampment. We were able to, uh, how well, shelter um, two pregnant women who were who had not received uh, prenatal care. Um, we're, we're recognizing that people don't stop suffering in homelessness just because the temperature improves. Um, that if we look at this as a legitimate societal concern, then we need to treat it like a legitimate societal concern and not like something that just pops up when the weather gets cold. Um, I also recognize yeah. that my approach is a, is a little bit more progressive um, than other operations that are that are just working overnight shelters. So I'm not suggesting I'm a, the only authority on, on the subject. I'm exclusively pulling from my own experience at Craig's Doors. You know, last year we started as an overnight shelter at the Lutheran Church. As a product of COVID, we became a 24-hour shelter and we never turned back. Um, the efficacy of a 24-hour shelter in improving the quality of life uh, and in um, uh, establishing permanent housing solutions, supportive permanent housing solutions for the chronically homeless, it's just increased dramatically since we've had this 24-hour year-round model. Uh, part of that is just a product of engaging with them more. Um, but I also think part of it is the development of that community and that trust and the relationships that are required for them to be able to heal. Um, we're a very trauma-informed model. We focus on the reality that most of these folks are in their circumstance uh, relative to um, a, a life of experiences that we can't capture. And so we, we just try and maintain positive regard for these folks to try and believe in them until they can believe in themselves. And I think that that requires 24 hour home support, a, a safe place to go. Um, and from a operations perspective, Nate, uh, I will tell you that running an overnight shelter when we're a low barrier shelter is incredibly difficult because we get folks warm and safe. And then in the morning we kick them out into the world. They have nowhere to go. It's freezing cold out, nothing is available they they return to their more maladaptive coping mechanisms they show up belligerently drunk we're a low threshold shelter but we're not going to put people out on the street you know so now we're having to navigate the impact not only on the individual but the impact that they're going to have on their neighbor and our staff and thus our organization as a whole when we're able to monitor behavior throughout the day and provide supports the outcomes are are just uh Again, it, it's just a it's just a, a, a brighter and and broad and, and a much more comprehensive success in terms of the outcome. So again, just to be a bit more concise, uh, UML. Hopefully, we're going to stick around for a long time. The ILC. I'm hopeful. I'm waiting on a call later tonight. Um, they may be interested in returning to an overnight um, operation and in. If that were the case, you know, we'll do what we can to explore other spaces for the 24 hour site, but that might be where we need to end up this year. But the ideal 
the ideal um, the ideal sustainable model for Craig Stores is a congregate shelter, a resource center, and a transitional housing space. Okay, so hopefully uh, we can move on because we do have we have to get to our planning of our forum that's coming up, which is the next thing on our agenda. So, is there anyone who just desperately needs to say something else, or can we move on? Then I'm going to pass it on to Erica, who's going to take us into the next part of the agenda. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, Tim, I just want to thank you for um, really raising awareness and an excellent conversation about yeah, why absolutely. this Amherst Municipal Affordable Trust is doing the work that it's doing, um, because we're really interested in all the way from the unhoused to permanent housing and home ownership. So um, we'll do as much as we can to help create that, that uh, tra trajectory where people can actually get housed. All right, um, so the next area is uh, discussing the um, September forum. Um, it's going to be on Tuesday, September 13th at 6.30 from 6.30 to 8 to 8.30 p.m. Um, the location social hall at the Unitarian Universal, Universalist Society in Amherst. But we have a question for the group, which is um, we want uh, the group to consider the possibility of moving this to a Zoom uh, meeting versus an in-person meeting. So it's something to just hold right now. Um, in terms of planning, and I hope John is here um, because John was also going to provide an update. Um, the last time we talked, um, we had looked at outreach and Risha, I think you were going to work with John um, to think about a plan for outreach, um, especially around the Fort River school community. Um, and then working possibly with uh, Wayfinders or Mike Morris to, to really think about a, a good outreach plan so we can get as many people involved as possible in this conversation and uh, finding out about um, you know, the, the Wayfinders project. Um, John, uh, if he's here, he's gonna give us an update around the Amherst he's media. Here. Okay, good. Um, and some of the reasons why we're thinking about Zoom versus in-person as well. Um, and then we were thinking about what are some of the logistical needs um, and how can we support those logistical needs. Um, and um, we're uh, both uh, Carol and I are going to open up the meeting, um, and, but I'm going to let John talk a little bit about where we're at with the forum and then I'll talk about what Carol and I intend to do and get some feedback from all of you. And Michelle from Wayfinders is here too, so she might want to come in and to be if she has things to say with John. Okay. You can decide, John. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we just have one more meeting before that, but we really want to make sure that we're totally organized and providing support um, necessary for this to be successful. Uh, yeah, I just, sorry, before John, nice to see you. I just want to say that the decision for remote or in person will, you know, it would be nice to make it tonight because, you know, we need to get that going in terms of information to the public. And if we want to post it on the calendar or flyers or anything, um, so, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, pressure anyone, but I think at the conclusion of the discussion tonight, it'd be nice to have a decision there just so we can, you know, get, get that moving. Um, I agree, Nate. Um, uh, Risha wants to speak uh, to talk about outreach. And uh, if Michelle McAdara wants to speak, I think that's fine as well. Um, Erica did a good job of summarizing what the plan is as it stands right now. I have one new piece of information that may impact on whether or not we want to switch to a Zoom meeting rather than an in-person meeting. Um, I have been in email conversation with Amherst Media. And this morning, late this morning, I received a, a note from uh, Jim Lesko, who's the manager of Amherst Media, they have been considering our request, which was to uh, both uh, uh, do a video of the meeting as it's occurring and also to broadcast it live um, over uh, their channel. The note that I got from Jim indicates that that's not what they're going to be able to do. And it's a short note, so I'll read it. Um, 
We have talked it over and have come to the conclusion that the amount of work to stream live out of that location, compounded by the fact that a lot of slides will be presented, we feel would work best for us and hopefully you is for us to videotape the event, get the slides from Wayfinder so we can insert them with full resolution. Then we would have a show to cable cast numerous times and upload to our YouTube account. The quality of videotaping off a screen and or wall doesn't translate well. So um, basically, while they, they will certainly record the event, they're not going to be able to stream it live, which was one of the hopes that we had. And so then we kind of have a difficult decision to make, which is what's the value of streaming it live, which we can do over Zoom um, versus uh, having the in-person meeting at the UU Social Hall. Um, we haven't had an in-person meeting for at least two years of this kind. I can't remember exactly when the last one was. We've generally had good attendance at in-person meetings, but we've also had pretty good attendance at Zoom meetings. Uh, depending upon the forum, we've had anywhere, I would say from 50 to 80 plus people attending in a Zoom forum. So from that point of view, I think community participation is as likely um, with Zoom as it is with an in-person meeting. Um, so that's the major decision we need to make. If uh, we do decide to do it over Zoom, I'm sure Amherst Media would uh, keep a copy of the meeting um, as it appears over Zoom and make it available on their website that may actually be easier for them to do than to come to the UU Social Hall and record the meeting live and then insert Wayfinder slides afterward. So uh, basically, I agree with Nate, we should probably make that decision tonight um, because we need to have a poster to share around and that would have to carry the information about the link to the Zoom meeting. Um, and we let, have to let the UU particularly know that um, while we thank them for originally scheduling this, we're not going to go forward with it. Well, it looks like Michelle had something she wants to say at this point. Okay. Okay. I think I'm unmuted, correct? Yes. Okay. I'm just curious what you guys are seeing in Amherst for COVID cases, because I know in South Hadley, in like the daycares and child cares and things like that, that it's running rampant. Um, and, you know, when this forum is supposed to hit, we're going to be back in school. And I I'm just wondering if it's safer, you know, for us to be doing it via Zoom. Just throwing that out. Paul has his hand up, so maybe he has a response. <laughs> yeah, I mean, cl clearly being in your own, you know, on your own screen is safer uh, versus <laughs> together. Um, we don't, we've lost the ability to really track um, COVID because we're not doing, people aren't reporting the tests anymore. We, we don't do asymptomatic testing anymore. Um, but I think you're right. We're just sort of anecdotally knowing a lot of people in town hall who are, you know, in just my circle of friends, people are contracting uh, the virus. I think you're right to be concerned about after Labor Day when all the college students come back and people go back from school. I think they're, we don't know what's going to happen. Right. Um, so I think the uncertainty is against us if we want to meet in person because we would have to be prepared to pivot to Zoom pretty quickly. And that could be confusing. I know Risha wants to speak. Um, so well, let's let Risha speak and then maybe we can just take a quick vote. Okay. Um, so 
I have been thinking through a marketing plan for the forum um, with John, and it's still uh, very draft. It doesn't look like I can actually share screens, which is fine. Um, I can talk through it, but um, essentially we, I mean, just so you know where I'm coming from, I, I do social marketing and behavior change for my career. So that means marketing of social ideas and trying to get people to adopt um, pro-social behaviors, typically. Um, and so the way we do this usually is to think through the goals and then the, the target audiences, which I know people hate those terms, um, the barriers and motivators for them to adopt those behaviors. And then um, we think of it as four Ps. So the, the product price place and promotion that would get us there. Um, so we've identified two goals for the forum. The first is to build support for the development um, as well, and in that is reduce or address any opposition uh, to the development. And the, the target audience for that is basically the neighbors. Um, I'm gonna stop there and explain the other one, but I need to come back because I, I do have some questions on what we know about the neighbors. Um, well, let me just go down that road. So typically we think about an archetype. So try to personalize the, the, the neighbor. And to me, the neighbor groups fall into a few categories. There are the landlords who rent out homes nearby the developments. Uh, there are the residents themselves who, who may rent or own places nearby. Um, and then there are the business, and I'm counting sort of churches and schools within the business community, um, but they could be considered slightly separate. Um, but they may not live nearby, but they spend a good deal of their time and, and care about the people coming through their doors. Um, what I don't know, uh, I looked on Zillow in the neighborhoods. Um, it looks like there's been immense turnover of, of home ownership in the area over the past two years. So it looks like about 50% of the homes in that area were bought in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, it's only what Zillow says. I, I can't vouch for how accurate Zillow is. Um, Salem Place is in that is in that vicinity, and so that also contributes a lot. There's a lot of properties in that uh, within like the 200,000 range. Um, but I don't know anything about these landlords. I don't know if they are um, they're living there. I don't know if they own if they're renting it out and own multiple properties. I don't know anything about the demographics of who owns them. Um, do any of us know anything about that? Or is there a, a, a public record that I could look at? Yeah, Risha, you, you and I should talk, um, you know, tomorrow or next week. Okay. And I'll tell you really ho bad horror stories. And uh, <laughs> I actually, I, I wouldn't know right now, but, you know, we have property records cards. And then if I know names, we can look up, you know, you can do LLC lookups um, through the state database and determine who, you know, who's the individual, but, you know, as far as I understand, a lot of it is rental, you know, there's a few immediate neighbors yes. to Belchertown, not to, um, well, to both, but homeowners to East Street School who would be concerned with the development. Um, they voiced it previously, um, you know, and then there's, you know, so there's two sites, right? There's the school and then there's Belchertown Road. Um, so yeah, we can talk, um, okay. you know, and I, I, I mean, in terms of how broad you're looking, we can just you know, I could we can I can set up a Zoom meeting and we can look at a property map and just spend some time walking through it. Um, okay, happy to do that. Um, and I'm sorry we haven't connected earlier. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, to go down further on that, so assuming that we don't have any particular knowledge within this group about who those landlords are and, and who the the residents are, um, hypothetically. Um, what we've come up with as barriers and motivators for them to be in support versus be op opposing the development. Um, we assume there are concerns about return on investment for either owners or uh, those who, the owners who rent out or owners who, who reside. Um, concern about noise, quality of life, uh, parking would also impact uh, businesses potentially and the types of people moving in. And those are just the kinds of opposition you hear around almost any affordable housing. So whether they're gonna come up in this case, I can't speak to, but those are the, the typical complaints. Um, schools in theory, I, this is a guess, would likely be happy to just have more students in their neighborhood. 
Um, so Fort River School would, would theoretically just be happy that there's family housing um, and more students. And the businesses would be happy to have more customers. Again, with the caveats of, you know, we don't like all these people hanging out or uh, the parking or the noise or whatever there, people scaring away our customers. Um, does that feel like I've covered the reasons that people may or may not be opposed to this? Uh, can I just say that um, with um, 132 uh, Northampton Road, a lot of these issues came up and it was, um, the forms were phenomenal in terms of how they address these. So I think, you know, you're on point with what concerns I heard from the neighborhood, uh, from people in the neighborhood. At the same time, there are lots of people who supported, right. um, you know, this. So I think, you know, I think it's great finding out, you know, what are the barriers. And I love the fact that you also have motivators, because I think that's, you know, um, thinking about what the motivators are for people to support it is really important. Uh, and I, I just remember all the conversations and having people um, come and talk about how they're so excited to have to have an inclusive um, community and, and being welcoming to others. So I think, you know, what I was going to say is, is yeah, I think um, identifying that and then, you know, Michelle's on the call, but then how, you know, how Wayfinders addresses those, right? So, you know, with Northampton Road, the most recent one, I mean, it was to the point where people were asking about the police records or, you know, the response of, um, you know, at the time it was Valley CDC for other properties that were similar. So, you know, if, you know, are there, what were the typical types of complaints against those properties? How were they addressed and managed? Um, and, you know, oftentimes a project's built and developed and then two years, three years go by and then everyone forgets what happened because there aren't any issues, but it's easy to say that now, but when it's happening, um, you know, it's hard to explain. So, yeah, I like, I like where we're, you know, how we're trying to set it up. Um, I do think that, you know, there, I, like I said, I think the immediate butters will probably be most concerned. And so then you know, things like screening, right, noise, light, all those things are just kind of the tangible impacts of development, and there may be more, but. Um, what was the first word you said, screening? Screening, like, so, you know, if, you know, like, right, if, um, you know, through vegetation or fencing, like, how do you buffer, okay. you know, an immediate um, property adjacent to the development in terms of, okay. you know. Thanks. Michelle has her hand up. So, you know, one of the big things is tax values. Um, you know, people always complain that their value of their property is going to go down with when affordable housing moves in. That one's hard to fight because it doesn't, but there's no real good, you know, data to prove that it doesn't, their values won't go down. Of course, everybody's concerned about the people who are going to be moving in and how management screens and we'll have management on um, or there at the meeting um, because they want to know about, you know, the tenants and, you know, are you going to allow sex offenders or drug addicts? And so there, that's a big one. Um, we hear this a lot, but in, you know, we try to tell people the number of children are going to impact our schools and our schools are going to be overcrowded at, but as all of us here probably know schools are asking for children <laughs> you know <laughs> they've had a declining enrollment for how many years and so the other one is parking you know because we don't usually do a two for one parking in our developments because we know, and we will address that because we have, you know, um, developments in Amherst and, you know, we basically do a one for one and not all of our spaces are even occupied. And traffic, 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 traffic. Oh, it's gonna impact your revenue. Um. Allegra has a hand up. Ah, um, yes, what was I, oh, what, well, one thing I was thinking just in terms of perhaps a strategy to garner support is 
thinking about the fact that, um, I mean, if it's family housing and we're rebuilding the Fort River School to house, you know, two of the elementary schools in town, kind of there's this parallel process of projects going on right there. And wouldn't it be great to, as we're creating a new school, create housing for families that will then utilize that school? Um, just yes. So maybe it, it makes sense for me to to go into the the four P's, and I know that's very markety, but and I'll explain what they mean in, in this kind of environment. But um, so the product is what we're offering, and and as I agree, Allegra, I think that the the framing is probably around family housing. Um, although it's mixed, but to emphasize the family, I think cuts down an enormous amount of potential opposition. Um, pleasantly designed with ample parking uh, was my little description of what I saw. Um, obviously that needs to be correct, um, but I think that the product is, um, is such that it will negate a lot of the potential opposition that we saw with more single unit um, housing developments, but we can talk about what else uh, can be added to the description or in reality. Um, the price in this context is not what it costs to, to rent or buy a unit. It is uh, what it costs for someone to be supportive of the, uh, of the development. And that can be time, that can be finances. Um, and so I think here is where we would want to emphasize that there could be an economic boon. Now, it's not a huge amount of housing, but you're bringing more customers into the area. There are more customers for your businesses. There are more students for your schools, uh, which, as you said, uh, Michelle, is, is wanted in this case. Um, but but people might not know that. So it's a good talking point to, to emphasize that our schools are undercrowded, not overcrowded. Um, the place is how we would talk to them about this. Um, and so where are you going to reach these folks? And that's why understanding who they are is really useful because if they are landlords that don't live in town, um, that might be a different method of reaching them than if we you know, are going to people who, who actually live in those houses. Um, so the obvious is the door-to-door -door visits and mailers um, and school leadership meetings um, to, to get, because I do think the school will be quite supportive and can be an ally in this. Um, and then finally, the promotion. So what what would we say on our flyers? Because that's the promotion we're doing. Um, and I, I sort of have this framed around sort of completing a neighborhood or making the neighborhood complete, bringing back our community um, as, as thoughts of how we might want to frame um, the kinds of benefits that we really get with this um, and, and how we introduce it. So as I said, that's one half of the plan because there is another goal around more unrelated to this development, supportive of affordable housing more generally. Um, but any thoughts on any of what I've said for that part of it? Michelle, I, I wanna, you need a lot. <laughs> yeah, sorry, John. That's okay. I wanna add one thing here. Um, when we were looking at 132 Northampton Road, there was very determined uh, opposition from the immediate neighborhood. And I'd be surprised if we see that here. <laughs> Nonetheless, we were successful in countering that opposition by having people write letters to town council, um, speak at public meetings who were in favor of the development. And I think that as we plan for this event, um, we should probably ask uh, anywhere from say three to five people who we think would be in favor of the development to speak publicly at the forum. Um, you know, for example, the religious community that's closest is the Jewish community of Amherst we could have somebody from the JCA potentially speak in favor of this development. Similarly, we look for other people. And I think that that might be a useful thing for us to have planned in advance. We don't have much time to plan this. I'm really getting concerned about the time that we actually have. Um, it, uh, 
Yeah, I agree, Michelle. Yeah. You know, my, my site design isn't finalized yet. And I don't even know what my 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 housing that will look like. <laughs> You're fading out, Michelle. <laughs> I know it's Zoom and it's me. I'm fading, believe me. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think, Michelle, that's a really good point. I guess, you know, we can talk about, you know, where, how how and where Wayfinders is in the process. So, you know, um, and then I think we should like, what exactly are we doing the for outreach? You know, um, would we mail a butters within 300 feet, which is kind of a standard process for, right. Right. you know, permitting? And would we also, you know, we can create, you know, um, put on the community calendar. It would be a posted trust meeting. It can be advertised other ways through the town. Um, but I think we could, you know, we can talk about that. Um, and then in Michelle, right, you know, are, is this an informal meeting or is this something that you would package as part of the project eligibility so it becomes? It would be packaged as part of the project eligibility. Right. Um, At least one of you know so yeah yeah um yeah so that yeah i think i think that's good yeah i do, i yeah I, i'm not i agree john i don't i don't i mean i was just looking online while we we're talking at who the owners are and there's a lot of non-owner occupied many of them live out of town um not that's not saying that the residents or the owners won't be you know curious or anxious about what's happening um, but, you know, there are multi-unit developments in the neighborhood. So, you know, you know, we can say that in terms of the scale of development, you know, I feel like it's, you know, there's already density in multi-unit development. So it's not out of character, um, you know, not, you know, so I think, yeah, I, I mean, the town, we were excited by, you know, by all this and we still are. So um, I think most people, I don't know how, I, you know, it's funny, you know, this happened, E Street School, we, you know, um, it moved forward, but you know, I'm not sure how much people have been keeping track of it or what they know right now. So, you know, I'm, I keep thinking like, oh, everyone will know about this, but it may be a surprise to a lot of people in the community. Um, and so I, I think we have to kind of be prepared for that, that some people may come and really not know much about the project or the process. If we, if we come up with an agenda that has a piece for the housing trust, a piece for Michelle Wayfinders to present what they are about and then maybe another piece that begins with a few people saying, gee, this is going to be great. And then a little bit of if we just make those pieces in an agenda, then each uh, or different people can work on the different parts that they're supposed to work on. And I think that it will work. And it seems to me like this is the first time out of the gate. This is exciting and positive and and I don't want to get it overwhelmed by the things we think might happen. I want wayfinders to present their great wonderful idea of how it's going to be i and i agree but like i said I, I don't even have a site design right now for one of the properties so i i may not be able to show anything I, i'm getting concerned time is running out what do you have a, an idea of what you will do if you don't have a site design? I mean, do you have a thing that you can do instead, or are we just doing this too soon? Nate, can you help me on this one? <laughs> yeah, so you know, we're the town and Wayfinder still is trying to finalize a few, um, you know, the <laughs> contract, and you know, they have a revised site plan for the Belchertown Road sites, you know, the three properties. So yeah, I mean, um, I mean, when do you think uh, if my, our architects have three right. weeks? Yeah, we, we're know, meeting next. We're meeting next week, right? Uh, I forget the date, but that's I mean, on the LD. That's on the LDA. Right. Well, I think it was also um, would also tack on the site design. So, I mean, I feel like okay. that's something okay. that. Okay. I did not know that. All right. Yeah, I mean, Dave and I, I think that's what we talked and assumed that. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I think people respond better to, you know, something visual, but if there's just a concept site design for both sites, and even if there's, I mean, you know, it may be that the, what the building physically looks like is going to change through permitting. And so, you know, when Diane presented to the trust a while ago, there's, you know, some, uh, you know, preliminary numbers for housing units and income ranges. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right we, we, so, I mean, I, I think all, all that. Yeah. But, 
that was, you know, having the architects going to be part of this and let them do their little spiel about the passive house and energy, you know, conservation and the green of it. And then, you know, we were going to have property management speak, but it, it is, it, it is nice to be able to show the abutters what the property is going to look like. It really is. Yeah. I find that goes a long way, you know, that they're not getting a, you know, 10 story where a lot of people, I don't know, have this misconception of affordable housing, you, you know, something from Chicago being built in their backyard. Um, and so a nice rendering goes a long way. Michelle, what are the barriers to having this, uh, what, what you want to have in place by the time of the forum? Well, most of it is, most of it I already have pulled together, John. So we already have a PowerPoint. I mean, you saw the PowerPoint. We presented yeah. the PowerPoint. Um, most of it's still pulled together, but it, it, it's the timeline. I'm uncertain of the timeline just due to, you know, certain things. So I'm, I don't know how, I mean, we can speak very vaguely about the timeline right now. I'd rather speak more specific about what I really feel is the timeline because I don't want to, you know, set a certain timeline and it not come close to fruition at all, you know? So it, it, it's just, there's a lot of little things. I'm, it's just, I am getting concerned of where we are, you know, and, you know, we're talking, it's a month away. So can, if I, if I can ask Michelle, when do you think you're at the point where you'd feel comfortable and confident about presenting this? Are we talking about another two weeks? A month away or like six weeks seven weeks or just five weeks i will feel more comfortable after probably our meeting next week with the town um it, it you know if Yeah, I, I, the thing is moving. We're not stopping. I mean, we've got our whole design team in place now. I've got all of our due diligence team in place now. We're, we're, we're moving forward as fast as we can. Um, but I'd like it to be a little bit more in place. You know? I, I hear that. It's uncomfortable, but I guess I'm... <laughs> We have a schedule for the 13th. Is there a reason that you think we should change that? Or will you manage to be able to do whatever I you can do? It won't be perfect, but it will be whatever it is. Is that okay? That is fine. As Good. long okay. as people know that, you know, the, the, some of the things are, we'll have to make sure, you know, I, I, I will feel better next week after our meeting. I really will. I, I, and I think Nate, can agree you know there are certain things that we need to still work on and once we have a little bit better understanding next week i'll feel more confident and i'll be more upbeat i promise it's an excite it is an exciting i love this project i really do um i love the design that we came up with i i think it's phenomenal and, you know, the people that we're going to help, the families we're going to help. Right. Yeah. So I, I agree. So we're meeting next week, early next week, the town and wayfinders. And so, you know, like I said, we're still finalizing some details with contract and other things. So I think that's, you know, where Michelle is hesitant because, you know, that, that isn't all in place. The, um, and I agree. I, you know, so the concept for the E Street School is really nice. And, you know, they, Wayfinders has adjusted the concept for Belch, for uh, Belchtown Road. Um, you know, uh, the trust, when they presented, there were some comments about, you know, the parking was in front and was more, um, you know, we'd like to bring the building closer to have a village center feel as opposed to an office park feel. And that's something that they're working on. So, you know, I feel like it's, 
in a position where, uh, you know, Wayfinders does want to move forward this fall uh, with, say, starting permitting. So I think this is, you know, Michelle, even, um, I agree, even if the visuals aren't ready, I, I feel like we would, it'd be great just to get this, the conversation started, um, knowing that, you know, you have to go through product eligibility and then, you know, that's right. a, that's one phase and then we have to wait to start permitting um, after that, so. Right. And there's a lot of diligence that needs to get done in between, you right. know. <laughs> so, yeah, I, and I'm just trying to put together a realistic, as realistic as possible timeline, because I don't want to give people a sense of false hope either, you know, of when when this is actually going to get built. Okay, so it sounds like we're going to stick with uh, the date and the time. Um, and it sounds to me that, you know, our agenda is um, we're going to open it up and introduce this. Wayfinder is going to take it from there. Uh, and then we're, I don't know who the we is, but someone's going to find uh, three to five speakers to uh, be putting out how they support this. Um, is there anybody who wants to volunteer to do that? I'll work on that, Erica. John, you work on so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Be able to come up with a tenant or two who may want to speak. I mean, we can ask our tenants at other developments within Amherst. So let me put that out there um, to see if we can get a tenant who would be willing to speak at the public forum. I think having somebody from Olympia Oaks would make sense, Michelle, if you can do that. I will check on that. Not guaranteeing we can get somebody, but I will check. And it's a beautiful place. So if people haven't gone by there, um, it's a very nice place. Okay. All right. So what else do you need? Um, Risha, do you have everything you need? Well, I'm only halfway done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, we're, we're only halfway there. <laughs> so, I, I mean, one of the things I want to point out is that if the um, the most recent or the, the, the closest landlords are not living there and live out of town, um, that might influence the decision on whether to go virtual versus in person. Um, they will be more likely to attend if it's virtual, I would presume. Um, and that is up to the uh, the trust to, to, to decide that, but I just want to point that out. Um, I also think, uh, and maybe I'm wrong here, but the, the sale in place that having that in the near vicinity, I, I feel like is a model for there is higher density housing in the area. And to my knowledge, there hasn't been a huge amount of problems now. Maybe I've forgotten and, and didn't know when it started, but I think that there's already a model <laughs> Um, in that neighborhood. So people, I don't think, would feel like it's changing the um, the face of the neighborhood that much. Um, and to, to Carol's point about being negative, I mean, I'm not suggesting we say any of this stuff. This is the, the stuff we consider so we have the answers if and when the opposition comes out um, and aren't surprised by it. So the other side of this is that the other goal, I would think, for the... Um, for the forum is to um, have people sign up uh, to keep informed, to become more active in affordable housing in the town. Um, I think I, I joked with John, he said, you know, the goal is to share information and let people know what's happening. And I said, if I, if you were my client, because I am a consultant, I would tell you the goal is never to share information. The goal is to make some, somebody do something with that information. And so I think the, the thing you want people to do is, and, and I am open to other suggestions, but is sign up for a mailing list or sign up to be connected so that as things happen, they are informed and can engage. Um, and ideally that that would be a, a place where we could also give them prompts of how to engage. Um, so who are these people? Uh, this is where I've actually done the most work. Uh, I looked at the mailing list and um, Googled every single person who signed up and looked at them. Um, and so this is my version of their demographics. I didn't ask how they identify themselves in any of these, um, but I took guesses at age, gender, ethnicity, and 
um, on the list, they had ca been categorized as sort of why they were on the list. Um, so of our, right, I actually had just closed that. Um, of our 86 people on a list, and I think it was a slightly outdated list because there were some technical difficulties getting the right one. But of the 86 names I had, um, we have 70% are, are female, 3% uh, unknown. And that was because I couldn't, oh, most of those are because we are sending to an organization, not a person. Um, and so I don't know who it's going to. Uh, I created some categories of who these people are. Um, the largest group was categorized as a housing advocate. Um, I think what that means is they just are interested in housing but don't have official roles within any current organization. A huge number of these were past trust members or past other kind of affordable housing community organizations members. Um, the next, so that was 35%. The next greatest group were people who I called CSO and connector. So these are people who work for local NGOs and sort of connect us with them. Um, that was 24%, 18% worked in the government, uh, the town of Amherst, 12% uh, worked for an or affordable housing org. These are not overlapping. I, I picked a category for each. 6% uh, were developers, 2% were businesses, uh, one, and 1% was a journalist, and 2% were connectors, um, which means that they didn't seem to have an interest themselves, but for instance, they um, were a representative for a church and would share messages, but it wasn't really for themselves. Um, 81% are white. I identified them as white. 7% uh, are Hispanic, 6% are black, 5% are unknown, 1% is Asian. So that's not great. Um, I don't know the exact makeup of the town, but I assume that's not reflective. Um, and age, we're all old. Uh, I made guesses and I made random categories of age brackets. Uh, so I decided that the categories were going to be under 40, over 40 or over 60. So this, the middle is 40 to 60. Um, and I think, and I'm probably wrong about a lot of these because I'm really just looking at pictures and guessing ages and this is not my forte, but I think 20% are above 60, 65% are 40 to 60, uh, and only 9% are under the age of 40. Uh, these are not judgments, right? I mean, it, maybe youth is not the target audience for our work, um, but it is a, a statement of who has signed up and who has engaged with us thus far. Um, so all that to say, our current supporters are white, female, over the age of 40, and actively involved in affordable housing or local nonprofits who's not in our supporter list that could be. And so I should frame here, I'm not looking to turn people who are opposed to affordable housing into signing up for our mailing list. I'm looking to tap into people who could be supporters, who might be, but have not actively engaged in any way at this point, um, but are sort of, you know, in concept um, supporting. And so we have no uh, people of color, or not no, but almost none. Uh, not many people under the age of 40 and not many men. Um, so that would be groups that we might think about specifically doing outreach to, uh, to engage with in affordable housing. Um, and maybe I'll stop there if there's any thoughts or comments and apologies to everyone who I misaged, gendered or raced in looking at their pictures. I just, just I just want to I just want to say that I'm totally thoroughly supportive of this work and I hope we hire consultants in a general sort of way because the outreach piece is just so lacking like people under 40 are the people that need the affordable housing that have like single father homes single mother homes people of color low income people tend to be can be single parents people under 40, et cetera. We 
we have to like find them, I think. I just want to add that we should hire consultants. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify, uh, Risha, when you said um, our mailing list, you mean the mailing list that we're using to advertise uh, and yeah, announce our meetings, you. et cetera. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. We do not have an, a, a trust mailing list. We have a mailing list for the Amherst Housing Coalition uh, that we push people towards in case they want to engage and they can share information um, about what's going on in affordable housing that, and we can share information to them to be shared. Um, if we so desire. But yes, I'm sorry, I, I didn't clarify. We don't have a mailing list. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I like the, the piece of, um, we have to make a decision if we're gonna do in person and Zoom, but the piece that um, one of the goals is to get people to sign on to action. Um, maybe I think, you know, John, I, I don't know, Michelle, John, Risha and Carol, if we need to meet uh, and to flesh out the agenda a little bit more, um, so we're clear about what we're doing, what our roles are, and um, how much time we're spending on each. That's fine with me. I wasn't clear what I was allowed to do that wouldn't violate an open meeting. So, you know, I didn't want to share this through email or ask any questions, um, you know, with larger groups, but it is very hard to do this um, and probably is not the greatest use of time to do this in a, uh, in, in a regularly scheduled meeting. It was good information. Um, and I think it's important for us to understand um, who is engaged and who we need to engage. So um, I think that was very important. Okay, so um, I think this is oh, good. Sorry, I'm not finished. Would you, like, would you like me to talk to someone directly separately? And, and open up the rest of the meeting because I know we're getting late. Well, I'm wondering if we need to, if there are three trust members, I don't think it violates the, the open meeting law if we meet with John and Michelle to plan, complete planning this out. Okay. And I'm wondering if we need to meet um, because you know Michelle's getting nervous about the time. I think we're also getting nervous about this time. We have one more trust meeting before the 13th um, and um, I was actually going to raise some um, some things about the slides that, that uh, Carol and I are going to be doing uh, in introducing. Um, and you know, we do have some time, but you know, I'm also trying to figure out how much time the trust has to open up the meeting. And um, you know, what we were going to do is start off with sort of defining the problem around affordable housing. Um, and looking at some of the data, presenting some of the data. And um, what I was going to ask is if people, especially Nate and possibly Rita, had more specific Amherst related data. The data that I looked at was what John actually presented in the CPA proposal, um, but um, if we had more specific data. Um, taking a look at the goals of the trust, the mission and the goals of the trust, presenting that. Uh, and then under each goal, the, the different actions that we've actually accomplished. And from that point is what continues to be the challenge and what actions um, our next steps are going to be uh, in the trust. But I'm wondering if, you know, we also need to think about what it is that we want others to be doing uh, in terms of action. So um, why don't we first start with making a decision about in-person versus Zoom? Um, so I would like to propose that we actually agree to do this as a Zoom meeting and see, uh, I make a motion to vote to make this a Zoom meeting, and then we can open up for anybody who disagrees. Second. Thank you. All right, so now anybody who um, has any concerns about making this a Zoom meeting can, can share their concerns. Okay, Risha, go ahead. Um, just given the geographical nature of this, I think it would be likely to get a lot more neighborhood engagement um, if they're all right there. Um, I think we will get more engagement from beyond the neighborhood if it's on Zoom, um, but to me, that's not the priority. Question. Hey, Allegra. Uh, I hear and agree with what you're saying, Risha, but I'm just wondering, because it would be at the UU rather than in the neighborhood itself, I, I wonder if that would change the demographic of who might be coming or if that would 
make it less less neighborhood oriented and more like middle of town oriented. Anybody else? Okay, then everyone who is in favor, um, I suppose I'll do a roll call. Um, I'm in favor, Eric is in favor. Paul? Yes. Risha? No. Ashley? Well, I'm a little conflicted. I think it would be better if it was in person, but I understand that more people, I, I'm a little conflicted, I'm sorry. I mean, it online is okay, but I think it's much better, even if it's later, to be in person. I would like to say in person is better. So yours is an A. <laughs> okay. <Sorry>. Rob? <laughs> Somebody okay. counting these votes. Yes, Zoom. Thank you, Rob. Carol? Uh, I forgot which way it is. I believe it would be better in Zoom, whichever. That's yes, right? That's a yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, Allegra, did I get you? You did not. Um, I am a yes. Okay. All right, I think I have everybody on the trust. So I think there were two names. Paul. And... Did you do Paul? Yeah, Paul was yes. Oh yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I'm. Okay, so um, I, I think we have agreed to a Zoom meeting, but that doesn't mean that in the future, I'm sure this is not gonna be the only meeting. And I think Risha, you raised a good point in terms of in the community, and that possibly maybe the school might want to um, sponsor a meeting. Um, so I think we should start off with introduction of this and maybe the wider audience is even better because then we can see who's supportive and where the concerns are. And then we can plan for a follow-up. I mean, I think this is probably going to be an ongoing um, education and outreach. So I think we've agreed that the 13th will be a Zoom. And I think we also agreed that um, we're gonna have a group meeting, a smaller group meeting with three of us trust members, Carol, uh, Risha, myself, and then uh, Michelle and John to flesh out the agenda and make sure that we're all organized and ready for this on the 13th. Okay, anything else be, before we move off the forum? Okay, thank you. All right, so the next item on the agenda is um, we had discussed the um, ideas of having committees. And I think Ashley, you really raise um, a committee that I think is really important, which is communications and public education. Um, so again, um, this is sort of the uh, follow-up of having raised what different uh, committees we thought might be of use and important and maybe um, one of us could um, volunteer to, to, to look at these particular areas. So around communications and public education would include updating the website. Um, you had other ideas around Twitter, um, Facebook feed. Um, I think, you know, I've looked at the website too. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for updating. There's a lot of good information, but a lot of it is old. Um, so I think, you know, that's definitely a committee that could, um, you know, be formed and, and have a lot of uh, opportunity to, to do outreach and education. Um, so it's something to consider. Um, and, okay, so the other committees are our legislative initiative. Um, we generally try to keep up and, tr and keep track of all the different legislative uh, initiatives that come forward um, and share it here. And sometimes there are opportunities to actually write letters of support. So that would be a second committee to consider. Um, the th third committee would be coordination, collaboration with other relevant groups or coalitions. Uh, Allegra's are already doing, um, you know, representing us and, and being bi-directional in terms of bringing back information um, that's relevant to our work and their work and finding opportunities to coordinate and support, possibly sign on um, to different efforts or sign letters of support. Um, the fourth was a strategic plan. Our strate strategic plan ends 2020, so it ends in December. Um, and we need to think about the next five years. What are we looking at in terms of developing a strategic plan and moving forward in the next, next five years? 
strategic plans are really sort of a blueprint and a guideline for um, what are we visioning, what are our goals, and how we how do we move forward. And so I think that's going to be really really important to think about um, the development of strategic plan. It doesn't necessarily mean that this subgroup has to do the whole strategic plan, but at least outlining it, coming up with recommendations, bringing back um, things that we can take a look at and respond to. Um, the other one is looking at different housing types um, and uh, promoting those different housing types. So we talked about tiny houses, accessory building units, um, and then also possibly looking at incentives for creating this type of um, housing types. And then the last one was uh, looking at new and existing revenue for the trust. So these were all the different ideas we had. Uh, we had one more idea. Um, if people aren't comfortable with, you know, being on a committee or, or um, leading a committee, one of the things we also thought was that there's there's so much information that's relevant with regard to our goals and our vision. If someone has an idea uh, or an, reads an article or learns about an initiative or project, or wants to bring someone in to talk about um, a particular area that they think the housing trust should incorporate or should think about um, you know, putting into the strategic plan or start action on, then you could raise, you could bring that topic in, you could invite uh, that person in, work with Carol and I, put that person on the agenda, or if it's a particular, you know, project or initiative, um, for example, someone um, had, you know, sort of explored what the Somerville Housing Trust was doing and brought it back here. Um, there was even a video link that they used just to sort of provide further information, further resources, best practices that we can share here and incorporate. Um, so that that's another opportunity for trust members. Um, to really be engaged and help us think about our own plans and our own vision. Um, and, and part of what we're looking for is really to make sure that we're all engaged in this and that we all feel an opportunity, that we have an opportunity to bring back ideas and to, you know, to think about where we're going to move ahead together. Um, so that, that is sort of the area of the, the subcommittees. Um, as we said in the past, Carol and I are available. If you want to send us that you're interested in um, being one of these on one of these committees, or you'd like to lead one of these committees, or you have a particular idea that you want to bring to the trust, then just email Carol and I, and um, we'll work with you on that. Um, and I know Ashley, you had also mentioned the possibility of having a consultant, maybe looking at communications and an outreach and an education plan for us. So that that would be something as well that could be a project that a trust member could lead. Um, so that's a lot to think about. Um, so I'm just going to open up if there are any comments. Oh, volunteers. So if no, um, you know, we don't have to make a decision tonight. Thanks, Erica. You know, um, subcommittees have to be posted. You know, they're, um, you know, they're formal subcommittees. They're subject to open meeting laws. So we're going to be taken, you know, and you can meet, you um, remotely, you know, I can help set that up and post and help with posting. So, um, you know, just to let everyone know that. So it's not something that, you know, you, you can meet on your own and just kind of, you know, meet spontaneously. It does have to be posted, you know, 48 hours in advance and everything and there needs to be an agenda in a minute. So, you know, that's, I don't want to, I don't think it's an obstacle. It's just, that's the process of, you know, of setting it up. I think there are a number of topics that could be a subcommittee. So the trust had some before and, you know, I, you know, I'd say it could be a few hours every month outside of the, the regular scheduled meeting where you meet and research and come back and report to the trust. And then, you know, we, we could, you know, set up, the subcommittee could set up a timeline, right? So whether six months from start, you'd have a product or something. So, you know, I'm not, and I'm not, I'll speak for myself. I don't anticipate that, you know, in a month or two, you're going to have something that's, you know, a, a finished product, unless there's something, you know, a low hanging fruit, as we say, that can be worked on. So some of these can be also just setting things in motion and that's really what the subcommittee is helping to do not necessarily you know completing a, a larger task but helping to move things forward thank you and, and i would say right now uh, we already have a subcommittee that's working on this forum so um you know risha and carol and i will work on this forum but there's so many opportunities to bring in you know to bring ideas to the trust and to really think about next steps and, and really moving forward some of the goals that we have all right so think about it. If you're interested, send us, send Carol and me uh, an email. 
uh, any one of these. And if there are any other ideas that you have, please send them to us. We would just wanna make sure that all of you feel that you have an opportunity to engage and to, to lead and to also share um, your vision. Okay. All right, so the next I believe is you, Carol, around the CPA. Um, yeah, well, it, the Community Preservation Act Committee is our, is, has been, will continue to be, I hope, our fundamental main source of financing. And this year, the application process, applications open, I think that means that you can find the thing you're supposed to fill out online on September 1st, and there are due September 30th. It seems very early, uh, but there it is. So, and my understood, at least what I understood from John about what the process was like before, there's a written thing that's submitted and they're asked, they ask you questions, you have to respond, probably you have to show up at some kind of a meeting and answer whatever those questions are. Some of the questions are written and you respond in writing. Um, in order to try to make this happen on time, I'm gonna try to make a draft of a proposal. I believe we only need the one this year to try to fund actual housing development work. We have a few things that we expect will be in the pipeline, Ball Lane, maybe eventually Strong Street. There are things that are coming down the lane. So we would like to have funds there to be able to do what we need to do. This, this round of funding is called 2024. The money won't be available until July of 24 or something. So how in the world we're supposed to know what we want then, I don't know. But luckily the housing trust is in the kind of unique position of being able to request funds because we think we will need them for something and, and have some ideas of what that is, but we don't have to actually always have a, this is the nuts and bolts of what we're doing. So I'm gonna try to draft something that I will have for our meeting on September 13th. I would love to have one or two people volunteer to have me be able to say, here's what I've got. What do you want to add? What do you don't want to add? And as long as there's not more than a couple of people, I think it will be fine. All we're doing is working on something that is going to be presented on the 13th. So if anyone is interested in doing that with me, please let me know now or later. Uh, Rob and Allegra, one, two, three, four. Nobody else, that's it. <laughs> also, Otherwise, I'm afraid we will risk some open meeting thing. But that means that I'll have a draft. I will, I will, because I know it, I know it'd be Erica and I, so Allegra and Rob, great. That's super. Question, and yes, I am still interested in helping, but also are, are we referencing the meeting the presentation meeting or our next trust meeting, which I believe would be the eighth. Oh, it is the eighth. Yes, sorry, you're right. Okay, just mistake. making sure the dates were. Thank you. <laughs> yes, it's the eighth. So yeah. So what's today? I'll try to have something in the next two weeks, at least for us to look at and do something with. And right, thank so you for both of you. So quickly, yeah, I, so the I, trust, you know, the trust can capitalize itself through CPA funds, so we can bankroll CPA funding. Right. It's, you know, it's it's uh, allowed through statute. You know, the CPA committee makes recommendations to council and then the council votes. So that's the process that takes a little bit. Um, you know, and and um, uh, John used to ask for quite a bit and we could, you know, always, you know, accept a, a reduced amount. Um, you know, we, Dave and I had met with Wayfinders a while ago, knowing that they're, um, you know, they're going to be moving forward with their project. And because this is so far out, um, you know, we suggested that they could also apply for funding. And so, you know, it's a strategy, you know, it may be that the trust puts in a proposal. If Wayfinders does too, if there's a lot more, you know, I'm not saying the trust would reduce what they're asking, but we could, right? So sometimes it's a matter of knowing how much money is available through CPA and how much um, the trust needs in a given year. So, you know, it, CPA has become pretty competitive in the last few years. So the last round, I think there was twice as much funding or maybe more, three times as much funding requested as it was available. And it became a, you know, a question for the CPA committee and for every applicant, you know, how much money do they really need and what, you know, how do you, how do you plan to use it? So 
you know, some of it is um, also being able to explain what the trust has done or is doing with the available CPA funding. And so, you know, half a million dollars might sound like a lot, but really it doesn't go a lot in terms of construction, right? It, it um, I think the trust has used it wisely in terms of providing Valley CDC funding uh, for Northampton Road. Uh, it's been used to help consultants to get other projects started. And so, you know, I think the trust makes really good use of the funding. Um, I'm just saying that, you know, it could be that uh, there's projects we're not anticipating, other housing projects, and it may it may be asked of the trust to reduce what we're what we're asking, right? Um, just so other project, other specific projects could be funded. Um, I still think the trust should submit a proposal, um, but it may be that you know there's three other housing proposals for projects that are more imminent in terms of you know yeah. need or something. Who knows what will happen after after our foot is in the door with by having right. a proposal to 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 put out there. Ashley wanted to say something. Sorry. Well, Ashley. I, was, I, I have no idea how much it costs, but um, in having some money for land that we can make tiny houses in or creating um, livable land out of the Hickory Ridge, there's a hundred and something like 50 acres. Some of it could be a tiny house village or RVs or whatever people want to create, but they still need hookups for water and heat and whatnot. So just land as a, you know, in addition to housing <laughs> is my idea. Okay. All right. Um, there has to, that definitely something that I could, well, let's worry about that when we write, try to write the proposal, but thank you for the idea. <laughs> um, so we are a little bit behind what time we thought we were going to be. I think that this part of Updates about the projects that are going on may be pretty quick because I don't think there's a lot to say. 132 Northampton Road, East Gables is uh, probably the slab has been poured, at least um, it. someone thought it was going to be when I talked when I talked to Valley, to Laura. She thought it would be poured this week, and I think that was last week. So uh, we've heard a little bit about Belcher Town Road. We're going to know a lot more about that when we on September on um, September thirteenth, and I believe the things that we might there might be something else to talk about. Uh, I will ask Nate if he has anything else on Strong Street, and if it, yeah, the um, I'll say John. There's two hands raised that we could jump to at some point. Um, yeah, Strong Street, we're, um, it's been a slow process. You know, there's a endangered species on the site and we've been working with Natural Heritage to determine how much of the property can be impacted. And so we have a botanist, um, we have a contract drafted up and I'm working uh, with, a, with a botanist and an engineer and the state to um, figure out how to uh, move forward. And it's, you know, it's not, it's, you know, it's a few thousand dollars. It's something that we just need to do you know, it's town property. So, you know, we're assuming it's going to be housing, but these questions have to, you know, at some point be answered because otherwise we'll, we won't really know what, you know, what development or anything could happen with the property. So um, I'm hoping, you know, in a few months time, we'll have, um, you know, all those studies will be done and we can kind of determine how, how to move forward with Strong Street. So, you know, the plan was still 10 to 15 units. I don't, you know, I'm not sure right now. Um, the state is concerned about impact on the property. So you have to be, I, 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 laugh, any, I laugh because, uh, um, you know, the, um, you know, it is a big process to go through. So we really have to go spend some time and have, you know, a few surveys of the property and have a lot of field work done to see if we can develop it, you know, on the face of it right now, we really couldn't. Um, is that, I, it seems like last time you were waiting for a biologist. I just wondered if, it's, if anything has happened that's different than last time. Any? Uh, yeah, yeah, we've had, yeah. I've had a few conversations and emails, and we've had um, okay. discussions. It's it's just it's the state's really concerned about impact to the species on the site, and so they really don't want any impact. And so um, because of okay. that, we've been having these conversations about what does that mean and how you know. So, anyways, it's it's still ongoing. There's no resolution, but I hope to have it soon. Okay. Well, uh, since we have two hands out there, maybe we will 
listen to our listen to what the two people, their two hands up, have to say since they raised them at this point, or maybe even before this point. Uh, John, your hands first. So I, I think that must be an old hand up. Oh, okay. Sorry. Well, you don't have to talk. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> uh, then we have Kathleen. Your hand is up. Yes, thank you. So I just wanted to mention that uh, and remind us that while there is a lot of land at Hickory Ridge, come spring, that most of that is a lake. Yes, most of it is a lake. Much of it is a lake that overruns onto uh, Pomeroy Lane, actually. Um, so there's, for uh, building or uh, uh, housing, most of it would be ineligible for that. Yeah, I think our understanding is that there's a small part of it that might be, and it's in some kind of process that the town is looking at what to do with it. Yeah, Paul, do you have small, anything? There's a small section on um, that abuts Pomeroy Lane that is dry and it stays dry. But most of that hundred and some acres <laughs> uh, becomes becomes a yeah. lake. And it's not a small lake either. It's a substantial <laughs> lake. Yeah. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, does either Nate or Paul have any update on what is happening at Hickory Ridge, or shall we just wait and uh, or is some other time going to be more useful to get information on that? Yeah, I mean the town, you know, Dave Zomack and the planning department are still, um, and and you know other staff are um, coming up with a plan for a public process there. So that's something that's still happening, and we'll, you know start uh, probably later, you know, this fall. Um, so, you know, I, yeah, I, I agree with Kathleen though. There's, when you go, when you look at it, it's really great. It's a really nice site. It's 150 acres and you are, you know, I think it's really impressive. And then, and you realize that there's uh, less than 10% of it could be developed uh, for housing just because of the environmental um, aspect. And then, you know, there is going to be solar on it, right? So there's going to be two solar fields uh, on beh behind the river to the North. And so then the town, um, you know, we'll own all, you know, there's some other areas that are along the river that need to be conserved, but there is opportunity for some type of development or process that will happen this fall. So, you know, you know, as, as it happens, the, you know, the trust can be made aware of it. Um, so the other couple of things we might've had updates on, we are hope to have next time. That's the, uh, I think Laura or somebody from Valley CDC, told us about the Ball Lane property last time. Um, and we've invited already Jessica Allen, who's the lead on that, to be with us next time to uh, give us an update on that. I know that it's like gonna be, they're looking to build 20, 40 units, 20 duplex, there'll be duplexes. So 20, 20 buildings maybe with 40 home ownership opportunities. And the other thing we're hoping to hear about, we're going to invite hopefully Dave to tell us about what's going on about the permanent shelter that the town is working on. Those two things, we don't have updates this time, but we hope to next time. Uh, does anybody else have an update on something or other of a project that's going on that I should have listed and forgot or something or anything else? Well, in terms of announcements, I think we were going to talk, uh, just mention the House Navigator of Massachusetts, and that I think really leads into some of um, Ashley's concerns about having a site where people can go and find affordable housing. Um, they've just, this is a, um, a Navigator site that ha just had over 100,000 users to find affordable housing, affordable apartments. And so it's a one-stop shopping where they can, can literally see the listings all over. Um, they stated that they had 176 rentals across 2,604 properties in 275 Massachusetts towns and cities. So um, we'll, we'll send out the links in the minutes so you can take a look at that. Um, doesn't resolve all of the concerns you have, Ashley, but I think this is a good, um, this is a good resource. And then the other thing in terms of announcements, we, we have one vacancy on the trust. Um, so I think it'd be really great if all of us 
looked uh, for somebody who would be great, who could complement um, our skills and experience and our perspectives. Um, and then we can um, ask them to apply. And Paul, I believe you are the appointing person um, for the positions. So those are the two things that I, I remember, Carol. Let sure. me just ask, I was gonna ask, Paul, if that's what is that what you are waiting for? Do you need some applications in order to begin a process to fill our missing position? Uh, I don't know how many applications we have. I'd check with Angela on that. Um, so she's going to be um, setting up. We're doing our next raft of uh, interviews, not next week, week after that. Um, so I just don't know how many applicants we have, if we have any. OK, thank you. Nate, what were you going to say? Yeah, I spoke with Chapa this week. Uh, that you know, the Citizen Housing and uh, Planner Association state level, they're they're studying um, kind of the marketing of um, smaller, you know, affordable units, and you know what the capacity of housing authorities, and you know, so I, I think they're looking at um, at that, and that you know, I mentioned that we at one point the trust was looking at you know having a regional entity that could do marketing for developments that have, you know, one or two or three affordable units, just because there is a cost associated with it. And so they're, they've realized that. And I think they're, they're kind of, you know, they're studying it and maybe we'll come up with some type of plan. So, you know, currently we have a few consultants that are in town that are working with developers that have affordable units to inclusionary zoning. And I think, you know, because they're in town, I think they've already have a marketing plan and um, they know the demographics. And so it's, you know, I think, Unfortunately, for the first developer, they paid for all this work, and now all the pre, the subsequent developers hopefully get it at a lower cost because they're already in in the area. Um, but at one point, the trust had reached out to Wayfinders or other organizations to see if they could become a regional marketing agent and help maintain affordable units, you know, waiting lists or other things. And you know, I, I just I just want to say that it's something that it's I think it's it's going okay right now, but it's maybe something that we keep um, on the back burner. Um, just because, you know, kind of to Ashley's point, you know, if someone all of a sudden has to find an affordable unit, it's like, how, where, where do they go? You know, the housing navigator is one, it's a website, but then who's a person or an agency? And we refer them to various places, but, um, you know, it'd be great if there was, you know, some way to coordinate uh, an application with all the affordable units in Amherst. Um, and so anyways, I, it seems like CHAP was, is also interested in that and looking into it. So, um, you know, sometimes regionalization is better and sometimes, you know, maybe for affordable housing in this aspect, it would be. So I'm not sure where they're going with it, but it was just, you know, they reached out with some questions and they said they're contacting communities and. It's good to know they're working on it. All right. Anything so else? Erica. Any other announcements? Okay, doesn't look like it. So now we're gonna open it up for any public comments that um, that anyone would like to make. And I'm not seeing any hands up from our participants and our attendees. Okay, so then we're gonna move on to any any items that we did not anticipate within 48 hours. All right, so lastly, um, our upcoming meetings. Um, so the next housing trust meeting is September 8th, Thursday, September 8th. And um, we just mentioned two agenda items, one ball lane, uh, the other um, Dave is gonna give us an update in terms of the town's um, initiatives. And um, I think that is it. And if they're, uh, as well as the forum, we're also going to revisit the forum and hopefully have very concrete agenda and ideas and possibly even um, share with all of you the uh, slide deck that we're gonna present, Carol and I are gonna present. Um, and, uh, and Carol is also going to have a proposal for the CPA ready for the eighth as well. So those are a couple yes. agenda items. And if there are any other agenda items that you can think of, please send them to Carol and myself. And I think that is it. And we have four minutes to spare for any comments, feedback. Oh, Timothy McCarthy has his hand up. 
I guess I just wanted to thank you again so much for inviting me tonight um, and and for the opportunity to sit in. I, I learned a ton and uh, I just wanted to thank you. Thank you all for your efforts in the, in the same mission that we're on. Um, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Uh, if anybody would like a site tour, I'd love to, to provide one. And, and again, thank you for um, affording me the opportunity to, to share. Thank Thanks you so for much. being here, Tim. Okay, um, no other hands are up, it seems. So I make a motion that we end the meeting. All right, I see Paul and Carol and Allegra. All right, the motion's been made. Any nays? Anyone wants to continue past nine o'clock? All right, I think we're done. Thank you, Allegra, for taking minutes. Thank you all for participating. It's been a great meeting and we will see you on the 8th. Great job, co-chairs. Have a good night, everybody.